to see you all back this evening, and I am hoping that um, your memory might be a little bit better than mine because we're going to kind of pick up on what we were studying all the way back in December. Now, I know that was only like a month ago, but sometimes my memory doesn't go back that far. So uh, just a quick refresher, at the very end of 2022, we spent almost an entire month studying our spiritual bank account in Christ based on Ephesians chapter number one. And we covered election, adoption, redemption, forgiveness of sins, knowledge of God's will, an inheritance in Christ, as well as the seal of the Holy Spirit. And we also talked about how it is that we access that spiritual account in Christ. We found that there were 11 times in 14 verses that the Apostle Paul referred to in Christ truth. And that was one of those things I encourage people to go through and read the rest of Ephesians and highlight or underline every time it says in Christ, in him, in the beloved. All of that comes back to in Christ truth. And that is we access this spiritual account by abiding in Christ. That seems to be a theme that God has us on for the day. So this evening we are going to turn our attention to the progressive nature of learning and knowledge as a whole. In all of life, learning follows a very similar pattern, and this is going to be found in your notes. It's also going to be on the screens off to the side of me. That is, we start in a place of ignorance. That is a lack of knowledge. And then there is awareness. That is an introduction of knowledge. So if you just pause there for a moment and you think about that, you start in a place of not knowing anything about a topic until somebody introduces you to the basics of it, and then there's an introduction of knowledge. There's an awareness of that. Then there is practice. That is the application of knowledge. And Lord willing, it's going to go to the other end, and that is proficiency. That is perfection of knowledge. All of learning is going to follow that same basic pattern. That is, whether or not a person is talking about learning to read, or whether or not you're learning to ride a bike, or whether or not you are learning math, or whether or not you are learning how to cook, you are going to follow that same basic progression. We go from ignorance to awareness, awareness to practice, practice to proficiency. And the ultimate goal is that we become proficient with the information that we have. Now, I want you to take that idea and bring it into a spiritual context. In its most basic sense, a disciple is a student or a learner of Christ. So that basically means that the entire journey is going to include those pieces. There is going to be a part where we are going from ignorance of truth to awareness of truth to practice of truth, Lord willing, to proficiency with that truth. Now, if we're not doing that, we're not actually making disciples. Because if we're not actually taking people into an introduction of information, if they are remaining in a stage of ignorance, there's definitely not going to be mature disciples made in ignorance. And if you just take them to the point of awareness, just introducing them to truth, that's not enough to make disciples. And let's, let's also go as far as to say it's good that people practice truth. But let's say a person practices the same basic idea. They're trying to live scripture, and they do it again and again and again for 30 years. They just don't get any better at it. That doesn't sound like we're making disciples. Hopefully, at the end of this, it moves towards proficiency, that there is a perfection of truth. Mature disciples are those who not only know the truths of God's word, true disciples, mature disciples, are those who are able, by God's grace and through the enablement of his spirit, to live out the truths of God's word. So one of the greatest breakdowns that we find in discipleship comes back to this progression of learning. That is, far too many churches emphasize and equate awareness with discipleship. Let me say that again. Far too many equate awareness with discipleship. That is, so much of the emphasis of the Bible studies and the services is on just presenting truth to make people aware of truth with the hopes that awareness alone is somehow going to transform the person's life. But here's the thing. You can be aware of a lot of truth that you don't ever live. You can be aware of a lot of stuff in the Word of God that you're not applying. Awareness is important, but it shouldn't end there. It needs to continue to move on through those other stages. Now, the trickle-down effect of what has happened within the church has been that many Christians now equate an awareness of knowledge, gaining new knowledge, 
with the goal of the Christian life. And you can actually hear that in the things that we say. As a pastor, I hear all sorts of things. Sometimes I might hear more than what I need to hear. But that these are common things people say. We will study a topic and they're like, oh, I already know about that topic. Or my last church studied that book of the Bible. Or I've spent a lot of time studying that. I, I want to learn something new. How, how many times have you had somebody, especially talking about their own devotional time, where they're like, I'm just not learning anything new. I, I'm, I'm hoping God's going to share something new. And there's always this idea of new or awareness is somehow growth. Somehow you need to get, keep getting new and new and new and new in order for a person to continue to grow. Listen, nothing wrong with new. I love learning new things. But here's the sad reality. Christians, all of us included, are aware of far more scripture than we are proficient at living. Awareness is not the ultimate goal. Awareness does not free people from besetting sins. Awareness does not heal marriages. Awareness does not change legacies. Awareness does not impact culture. It needs to go from awareness to practice and practice to proficiency. Disciples are going to follow that same basic progression. We need to move from ignorance to awareness. Awareness to practice. Practice to proficiency. And we do this again and again and again. Each new concept, each new teaching, each thing that we come into within the word of God, we are following that same progression. Now, it is the progressive nature of learning that kind of has our focus for this evening. So here's the way the, the text is breaking down. If you want kind of a, a big 30,000-foot view of what's taking place in Ephesians chapter 1, here's what that would be. In verses 3 through 14, Paul shared the unlimited blessings that believers have in Christ. That's that spiritual bank account that we studied this last year. Now in verses 15 through 23, Paul prays that we will fully understand those blessings in a knowledge that is gained by experience. And that's going to be key tonight. It's not just knowledge that is gained in a classroom setting or an academic setting or a study setting, but it is knowledge that is gained by experience. And I'm going to show you that this evening in the Word. He wants people to go from ignorance to a place of proficiency. He wants believers to begin to live out and to act upon the blessings that are now theirs in Christ. This is a section about application. This is a section that is about maturity. As you'll see, this is a section about prayer, and this is absolutely a section about proficiency. So we've got a lot to cover tonight. I invite you to go with me in your Bibles. If you're not already there, Ephesians chapter number 1. I will be in verses 15 through 23. And I am sharing tonight the first part of a message entitled Praying for Proficiency. Here's what it says, starting in verse 15 and following. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his call and what is the riches of his glory and the inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ, there's that, that phrase again, in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this evening that your spirit guide us into all truth. We ask this evening, Lord, that you would take a text that in many ways has so many pieces that can sound confusing. And Lord, you would turn it into a text that comes alive so that there are light bulb moments that are happening tonight for every person who is in the room, every person who is listening online. God, would you allow us to be able to 
walk out in proficiency the truths that you have given us in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. So it is believed at this point that there's now been four years since the Apostle Paul was in Ephesus. In four years, he has gone through a lot. In fact, when he is writing these words, he is writing from prison in Rome. And life has been tough in many regards. I'm sure when the Apostle Paul was thinking about his life, even though Jesus said, I will show him how much he will suffer for my name's sake, even though Jesus says that on the Damascus Road, you find that sometimes we we underestimate what that looks like. I'm sure when Paul is thinking about taking the gospel to people, he didn't always think that there was going to be years of his life that had been spent in prison. But even though he was in prison, it did not mean that he was not active. While in prison, he's still preaching to the prison guards. While in prison, he is writing letters to the churches. While in prison, he is praying for the saints. So we find in verses 15 through 23, it records one of those prayers that has also been found in one of those letters that has been written to the churches. And we know based upon what we find in verses 15 and 16 that there's at least three pieces that help the Apostle Paul understand and stay informed of what's going on. Here they are very quickly, and that is we know that Paul was informed about the church. We also know that Paul was impressed with their reputation And we also see that the Apostle Paul was incessant in his prayers. So let me walk through those very quickly. They're all found in verses 15 and 16. Basically, we know that he was informed about the state of the church because he says, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints. It might have been four years since the Apostle Paul was in Ephesus, but he still knew exactly what was going on in that church in Ephesus. He was still hearing from friends and ministry partners and through letters. He he was informed. He knew what was going on. Also, he's impressed with that reputation they had. There's two things he mentioned. That is, he says the church was known, in verse 15, for faith in the Lord Jesus and for love for all the saints. Can I just tell you, if that's what the church is known for, that's a solid reputation. If somebody were to say, here's what I can tell you about Sherwood, they have faith in God and they love each other well. That's a solid reputation. But we see that it doesn't mean that they were doing everything perfect. It doesn't even mean that they were applying all the truths that they knew. We understand that based upon what's happening in the text. But we do see that they emphasized those two pieces, and it was showing in the reputation of this church. And finally, the Apostle Paul was incessant in his prayers. He never stopped praying for the believers in Ephesus. He tells the group in verse number 16, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. Now, that's an interesting statement to me. In fact, you find out a lot about somebody's prayer life if you listen to what they're saying. In this case, if you read what Paul is actually writing. Paul's heart is filled with thankfulness every time he's praying for this group of believers. Think about it like this. Thankfulness is both a gift from God as well as a mark of maturity in a person's life. Let me share it from the perspective of a pastor. As a pastor, sometimes also as a small group leader, a ministry leader, a counselor, somebody who is walking with people through difficult moments in life, it is so easy to focus on the things they don't get yet that you fail to thank God for the things they do get. This is an important piece. The Apostle Paul understood that they were not living in the fullness of what was theirs in Christ. We know that. He's addressing those things right here. We get to the very end of this letter, and he is going to bring some other correction. There's issues that he's addressing, but that didn't get in the way of him thanking God and having a thankful heart for the things that they were doing well. And there is a subtle, but there is an important distinction, a principle at stake here that I want to mention, and that is take time to celebrate the spiritual victories in each other's lives. It's important to take that time. In fact, if we wait until every person in every, every church is fully developed in Christ before we celebrate, you will not celebrate on this side of eternity. 
there's always going to be another step. There's always going to be more sanctification. There's always more growth that takes place. But it is important that we celebrate those things. It's not important of how fast and how far and how quick they got there. Celebrate what God has done along the way. One of the issues, actually there's a couple of issues. I'm just throwing both out here. Okay, one of the issues people face when it comes to celebrating is we always try to make people think we are up here spiritually. We're actually here. So when we do get here, you can't really celebrate because you can't let people know that you were not where you originally told people you were at. It's a good piece to be honest about where you are in Christ. But here's another thing. So many times, especially as parents, we can look into our kids' lives and we're like, I, I, I'm wanting them to get this. I want them to get this. And like, oh, It's so frustrating. Why aren't they getting this part yet? And if you stop and say, God, give me eyes to see what it is that they have gotten. And all of a sudden you look back and you're like, oh, they're walking in truth here. They understand this piece. They got that when God's doing this in their life. And all of a sudden you look back, there might be 20, 30, 40 other things that he has already done that you didn't praise him for back then. It is important to take the time to go through and celebrate the spiritual victories along the way. So in verse number 16, the Apostle Paul tells us that he is constantly praying for this church. But then in verses 17 through 23, he tells us exactly what he was praying. And this is one of those great texts in order to help each of us when it comes to our own personal prayer life. So let me pause here and kind of give a, a story from my life. Uh, a number of years ago, I came to a place in my prayer life where the only word I can describe it as is I was bored with my own prayer life. I don't know if you've ever been there before, but it's kind of like you're praying the same things for the same people in the same way over and over and over and over, and that same list is looking at you the next day, and you're thinking to yourself, this is, feels lifeless. It's like, I'm bored. God's probably bored with this. Like, nobody's having fun with my prayer life right now. So there, I was in one of those places, and in providence of God, I happened to be reading this particular text. And when I was reading this text... I was just saying, God, is there something unique in Paul's prayer life that I need to see? And it was like this very clear thing. Look at the patterns of his prayers. And I just, just took some time. I began to look through the, the writings of the Apostle Paul's prayers, and very quickly a pattern emerged. And that is, in Paul's prison prayers, which you find those in Ephesians 1, Ephesians 3, Philippians 1, Colossians 1, in these prison prayers... He didn't ask God to give believers what they did not have. Instead, he asked God to reveal to believers what they already have. That was a game changer for me. The emphasis is not on gaining something new. The emphasis is on seeing what is already there. And he prayed that over and over again. And here's what's happening to this. He has now spent 14 verses helping believers understand what they have right now in Christ, in their spiritual bank account in Christ. And now he's taken this next section of the chapter asking God and praying for them that they would be aware of what they have so that they can live what they have. Not God give them something new, but God help them to be aware of this so that they live these truths. So his prayer has four different parts. And I'm only going to cover two of those parts tonight. The first is, Paul prayed that we would know God fully. Verse number 17. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Now there is one phrase, based upon what I just said, that should stand out, jump out in that verse. And that is, may give to you you. Now the reason that stands out is because he's already told us about everything we already have in Christ. And now he's praying in this that God would give them something like, what else could he give? We have everything in Christ. We are complete in Christ. There's a fullness in Christ. So what exactly is he praying about? He prays that God would bless you with a spirit of wisdom and of revelation. Now, I want you to take note of the fact that the word spirit is not capitalized. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit here. 
In fact, believers already possess the Holy Spirit based upon Romans chapter 8, verse 9. And for that matter, he has just talked about the fact in verses 13 and 14 that we were sealed by the Holy Spirit and have been given a pledge of our inheritance. So this is not an issue of whether or not he is praying that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, in Greek, there is no article that is in front of the word spirit. In such cases, the indefinite article is often used in English to help with an ease of reading. So it would be a spirit or a spirit. But also translators are really careful on this because they don't want it to appear as though the Apostle Paul is praying that they would receive another spirit outside of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So what they do is they try to combine the two sometimes for ease of reading. They might say the spirit, but it's a lowercase s. Or they say a spirit, lowercase s. Helping them see this is not praying for the Holy Spirit. They already have the spirit. Not praying for an additional spirit because we don't need an additional spirit apart from the Holy Spirit. But here's what that word means. It's talking about a mindset or a position of action. It is the exact same terminology that is used in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, when it says, If anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. It's not praying for another Holy Spirit, not praying for a different spirit, but rather praying that they have a mindset of gentleness, that they are in a position of action, that they are acting in gentleness. That's what that idea is talking about. So here, he is asking God that the believers in Ephesus would have a mindset, a position, and a position of action that is based on wisdom and revelation. Now, those two words are key. The word wisdom here speaks of a knowledge of the deeper things of God. It is the Greek word for Sophia. The word revelation is apocalypsis. It means disclosure, manifestation, enlightenment. He's asking that there is wisdom and revelation. And those are two things that do not come with just simply a higher level of intelligence that comes from God. Rather, those are things that come by experiential knowledge of being with God. That is, we get to know him more. And as we know him more, he discloses himself to us. That's what Jesus says over in John 14, verse 21. He said, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and here it is and will disclose myself to him he will disclose he will reveal he will show us who he is so let's pause here for just a moment all of the theological pieces have now been put in place for us to understand this prayer but I want us to to talk as plainly as we can possibly talk about this text here's what the apostle Paul is praying he's saying God would you give the people in Ephesus a wisdom as well as a revelation that comes from the time that they are spending with you? Not something that they're picking up in a book, not something that they heard from someone else, but may they have a deep knowledge of you. May there be revelation that comes from you. It's the stuff that only comes because they've spent time in your presence. And he wants them to have this because even though they have the spiritual bank account in Christ, if they don't have a deep knowledge of God and revelation that comes from him, they will not be able to access what is already theirs in Christ. He's saying that they need this. God, give them the spirit of wisdom and of revelation that only comes from time with you. He wants them to know God, and he also wants God to activate those blessings in their life. Now, I've shared this before at least a hundred times since being at Sherwood, but now seems like another appropriate time to share the same statement with you. You already know where I'm going, some of you, but I'm going to start. There it is. There it is. Everything God desires to do in and through your life, he will accomplish out of the overflow of your relationship with him. Everything. This is another one of those texts that's telling us the same thing. 
In order to access the spiritual bank account in Christ, it comes by abiding in Christ. That's intimacy with God, relationship with God. In order for us to even see what we do in the process of abiding, it needs to be that God has given us wisdom and revelation that only comes from being in his presence. In other words, apart from this abiding relationship with Christ, you and I are trying to do in self-effort what can only be accomplished by his Spirit. And let me tell you, when we try to do it in self-effort, that leads right back into works-based righteousness. And it leads right back into an oppressiveness of living under a standard that you and I could never reach on our own. But when he's the one doing it, when, when we get up in the morning and our thought is not, how do I live all of the commands of the Bible, but rather How do I spend time in the presence of my Savior? How do I sit with him and so get to know him and understand his heart and have this deep, intimate knowledge, this relationship with him? How how can I be there so that he lives his life through me? That's a life that walks in freedom. But if we don't get that, we spend the rest of our life just saying, God, help me tomorrow to, to apply this. And then we mess up and we're like, all right, Lord, that was a bad day. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to do better. And then we don't do better. And then we're like, God, this is frustrating. And then you get like two or three good days behind you and you're like, I'm doing it. And then pride kicks in and you fall right back down to where you came from. And and you just keep going through that cycle over and over. There is no freedom in that. Freedom is found in the presence of God. Freedom is found in abiding in Christ. Everything God desires to do in and through your life, he will accomplish out of the overflow of your relationship with him. So here's the question that we now come to. What does it actually mean to know someone? Look in the text. He prayed that they would have a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. In the knowledge of him. What what does it actually mean to know someone? Well, here's the thing. In order to actually get to know someone, they have to reveal who they are to you. You can learn about someone in a book. You can learn about someone through conversation with others, but you don't get to know that person unless they're willing to reveal who they are to you. In fact, there's a lot that happens when you can sit down with somebody one-on-one, face-to-face, that you get to know more in a face-to-face conversation than what you do through text messages. You get to know more in a face-to-face conversation than what you get on a phone call. Do you know why? Why? Because you can look in their face and watch as they describe things. Somebody can say truth, and it might sound one way, but when you look in the face, you can watch how it is that 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 idea is coming out in their life. There is something about the fact that a person has to reveal themselves. They have to help open up and show likes and dislikes. They're, They're things that they are thinking and things that they are feeling, their frustrations and their fears, their wants and their wishes, all of those things come into getting to know that person. And here's what Paul is praying. He's been praying for four years for the people of Ephesus that they would have a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. He just keeps praying, God, help them to know you. Help them to know you. Reveal yourself to them. Help them to know you. It's almost been 20 years that a regular part of my prayer life for my family is I pray daily, God, would you reveal yourself to myself, to Bria, to Shana, and Kaylee? Would you reveal yourself in your word? Would you reveal yourself through prayer? Would you help us to know you in Christian community? Would you help us to see you and understand your heart in the affairs of life? My prayer is, God, unless you reveal yourself, we're not going to figure you out. We know he has revealed himself in the word, 
We know he has revealed himself through Christ. We know that there's parts of his character that we can see in creation. We get those things. But there is a part of that, that deep, intimate, experiential knowledge with God that unless he is the one who does that, we are going to remain at a certain plateau spiritually. It has to be that he is revealing himself to us. Now let's bring those pieces together for just a moment. How do we access our spiritual account in Christ, that was the first part of the chapter, it comes by abiding in Christ. How do we get to know God? That's the part we're just talking about there. You have to abide in him, and he must reveal himself to you. There's two parts of that equation. So the first part of Paul's prayers for the believers in Ephesus was that they would know God fully. Here's the second part of his prayers that they would know the hope of his calling. It's found in verse number 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Now remember, he's saying eyes of your heart. He's writing to the believers in Ephesus. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. This is a, this is a verse that as I sat with it for a while, it was, it was one that, it took me some time to process this. And I still don't know if I fully have the pieces, but I'll share with you the pieces I feel like God has connected in my heart. He is using a figure of speech here when he talks about the eyes of your heart. In modern culture, our, our heart is often seen as the seat of emotions and the seat of feelings. But in the ancient world, it was not only recognized for that, but also considered to be the center of knowledge. It was the place of understanding and thinking and wisdom. And he basically is saying, I'm praying that the eyes of their heart would know what is the hope of his calling. Hope, calling, hope of his calling. The ancients believed that the heart could learn things that the mind could never fully grasp. And if you think, oh, that's just ancient superstition, we actually say a lot of the exact same things. In fact, how many times have you heard somebody say this? I just got a gut feeling about that person. What they're saying is, I, mentally, there's not anything that's necessarily telling me something. There's just something inside of me that's informing my view about that person. Or we'll say something like this. I, I have this intuitive knowledge or a feeling about this particular thing. Uh, sometimes people will use those types of phrases of things that we, we know or feel or sense that our brain is still struggling to try to make the connection between those. And, and here's what Paul is saying. I'm praying that the eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you would know what is the hope of his calling. In other words, may the knowledge of his calling not stop in the head, but may it go all the way down into the heart. Information that stays in the head does not transform a person's life. We need that information to sink into the core of who we are, to impact our feelings and our emotions and our actions and how we respond and what we do. It, it needs to sink in there if it's going to change a person's life. There is this link between hope and call that I think is very significant for us to point out right now. When we talk about the word hope, it's often with the idea of uncertain things. Like, I hope my team is going to win. Like, it could happen, might not happen. It's, it's uncertain. I, I hope that this person might come over for dinner. I, I hope that this particular event might happen. It's uncertainty. We speak of hope in terms of uncertainty. But scripturally speaking, hope is not spoken of in terms of uncertainty because it is grounded in the work of Christ. So here's a couple of references to write off to the side. 1 Peter 1.3, it speaks of a living hope. Then we find Titus 2.13, it is blessed hope. And then we also find Hebrews 6.11, it speaks of a hope that is sure. There is a confidence that comes with hope according to Scripture because it is grounded in the work of Christ. Now, the word called is also an important word in the Christian vocabulary. We have been called, according to 1 Peter 2, 9, out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So now let's combine those two words. Paul wants us to understand the hope that is ours because of the calling 
that we have in Christ. He wants us to understand what is certain because of the calling that has now come, being brought out of darkness into his marvelous light. So why is it that we need to understand the hope of our calling? Why is that important for believers? Here it is. Because the fullness of this call has yet to be realized in our lives. Let's pull this out for just a moment. There are times when you will experience such uncertainty, tumultuous moments in your walk with God, that the, the doubts and the fears begin to creep in, and the enemy will use those moments in order to cause you to question everything you think you believe about God. It might be that you prayed and prayed and prayed for a family member to be healed, and God chose not to heal them on this side of eternity. But at the same time, somebody else was praying for their family member to be healed, and God healed that person. And now you're wrestling with this thing of, God, why would you do that for them and you wouldn't do that for me? Sometimes a person can be walking in righteousness and they're walking with God and yet they find themselves in a place where maybe they lose their job and they lose their house and they, they go through financial turmoil and the, the things are so up in the air that they're just like, God, why is this happening to me? There are those times when you are tempted to think, have I made this whole thing up in my head? Is God actually real? Is salvation true? Is the gospel true? Like, I know people who have no relationship with God, and they seem to be having a wonderful life. And I say I've got a relationship with God, and I am in turmoil right now. What is happening? Is there something that I am missing? Here's the thing. If a person is wrestling through those types of feelings, they need hope, certainty in the calling that they have in Christ. One of the things that I've shared for years is a person who has hope, especially in counseling, they're willing to go through the process. The person who has no hope, they just say, it's done. It's finished. Hope is incredibly important. He's saying, I'm praying that their, their heart would be enlightened, that their eyes would be open to the hope of their calling in Christ, the, the certainty that they have in Christ. So why exactly is he praying that for this group of believers? He's praying it because they've got all of these blessings found in verses 3 through 14. But all of those blessings are not going to matter if they walk away because of the problems and the tumultuous life that they're living. They're not going to access it if they forget the hope of the calling that they have in Christ. So here's what happens. If God enables that person to comprehend in their mind, let it fully grasp what's going on, let these truths sink down deep into the core of who they are, where they can taste of God's goodness and they can see his activity through the eyes of faith and they can understand a little bit of the glory of what he is doing around them. If they get at that gut level, at that core level, they will know without a doubt that even in times of uncertainty, the same God who chose them in eternity past is the same God who is holding them in the current moment that they are in. That person can go forward because they say, I know what he has done for me. That is hope in the calling that they have in Christ. That is why that is important. So how does any of this move from a head knowledge into an experience, into living out these truths? This is going to sound familiar to you. We've got to abide in Christ. It comes out of this abiding life in him. Because unless he gives us wisdom and revelation, unless he opens our heart to understand, unless we see what it is that he has done for us, we are still going to try to do it ourselves. Abide in him. Gaze upon him. As you abide in Christ, God graciously removes anything that competes with his affection. He does an internal work as we abide in him that every church service in the world would not do in your life. He does an internal work in you as you abide in him 
that you could take every Bible study out there and it's not going to do the same thing. He, he does this work, internal work in your life of abiding in him that all the counseling in the world can never do. That is not to say that God does not use every one of those pieces that I just mentioned, but here's what I want you to hear. If a person misses individual, personal, moment by moment abiding in Christ, they will never make up through the knowledge of the Bible what is missing through intimacy with Christ. That peace has to be there. That is the activator of all of the rest of the information. My prayer for Sherwood is that God moves us through the natural progression of learning. That we go from information about Scripture, we go from ignorance to awareness, from awareness to practice, from practice to proficiency. We don't stop at one point along the way and say, this is good enough. We say, God, we want to live it all. We want to experience it. We, we want you to fully do your work in us. And for that to happen, we submit to you. We will abide in Christ. And we're going to ask you to do in and through us what we could never do for ourselves. So as we finished out the first part of Ephesians at the end of 2022, I encourage you to underline or highlight every time it says, in Christ, in him, or in the beloved. Here's your homework at this point. I'm going to encourage you to pray what the Apostle Paul was praying for the believers here. Pray that for your life. Pray it for your family members' lives. Pray it for those that are around you. Follow that same pattern of prayer. Let's see what God's going to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for those who have come out. Thank you, God, for your word. We ask that we would live in this abiding relationship with you, where you live your life in and through us. And God, we will be grateful for what you do there. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful night. We will see you this next week.